Sir, I replied, turning to him, what your motive can be in reciting to me with a serious face this remarkable farrago, I am utterly unable to guess, but you are surely yourself too intelligent to suppose that anybody but an imbecile could be deceived by it. Spare me any more of this elaborate nonsense, and once and for all, tell me whether you refuse to give me an intelligible account of where I am and how I came to be here. You do not, then, believe that this is the year 2000. Do you really think it necessary to ask me that? Very well, replied my extraordinary host. Since I cannot convince you, you shall convince yourself. Are you strong enough to follow me upstairs? I am as strong as I ever was, I replied angrily as I may have to prove if this jest is carried much farther. He led the way up two flights of stairs and then up a shorter one, which landed us upon a belvedere on the housetop. Be pleased to look around you, he said, as we reached the platform, and tell me if this is the Boston of the 19th century. At my feet lay a great city, miles of broad streets shaded by trees and lined with fine buildings for the most part not in continuous blocks but set in larger or smaller enclosures stretched in every direction every quarter contained large open squares filled with trees among which statues glistened and fountains flashed in the late afternoon sun public buildings of a colossal size and an architectural grandeur unparalleled in my day raised their stately piles on every side. Surely I had never seen this city, nor one comparable to it before. Raising my eyes at last of the horizon, I looked westward, that blue ribbon winding away to the sunset. Was it not the sinuous Charles? I looked east. Boston Harbour stretched before me with its headlands, not one of its green islets missing. I knew then that I had been told the truth concerning the prodigious thing which had befallen me. What will it be like in the year 2000? Anyway, yep. (laughs) From Looking Backwards, 2000 to 1887 by Edward Bellamy. Written in that year, 1887. uh, And we're talking about it on a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. I'm George Gingell. It's a rather charming utopia of the late 19th century. Was, it was, was this the third highest selling novel in America in the 19th century? Is that right? Within a few years of its release, it was the third highest selling novel ever behind... Presumably Uncle Tom's Cabin and something else. Yeah, Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur! Ben-Hur is the other one. Oh, um, yeah, I've forgotten Ben-Hur was so successful. And it is now almost not read at all. Yeah, I think Looking Backwards really only read by sort of scholars of 19th century and utopian fiction and not all the time by them. But we're talking about it and its uh, really significant influence and we'll be we'll be taking you through it. This is the second part of our two-part discussion of, of machine utopias of the late 19th century. So, yeah, I mean, how do we describe this? The scenario and one which is kind of much repeated is that of a man of the 19th century who, through sort of semi-miraculous means, goes to sleep one night and wakes up uh, in the dawning of the 21st century. And it's the story of the I mean, society that he finds. I mean, this is a seriously old conceit, right? There's the seven sleepers of Ephesus, which is the like Roman Christian one where per- seven persecuted Christians go into a cave and fall asleep for a uh, hundred years. And then and uh, everything's like the forums just abandoned and everyone's gone and there are all these crosses everywhere but actually it must be just luring them into a false sense of security so i mean i guess we should talk a little bit about why looking backwards has such an an enormous effect the society which it which it presents is is a utopia it's like the is the world remade with the benefit of new technology and also a kind of reconstruction of the economy so as to deliver a wonderful life for everybody it's worth saying that this one much more than the ones we were talking about last week this is really pretty thinly veiled kind of speculative political manifesto with the kind of story dressing last time we were talking about things that really are kind of novels albeit fairly weird ones this is feels very bellamy is presenting a late 19th century socialist sort of prospectus on the future. He's very careful to say that he's not a socialist. He's kind of politically quite careful. But yeah, sort of presenting the possibilities of a post 
capitalist society as it, as it would have been imagined then. And it, just to say something about its influence, it was enormously successful in terms of sales and also in terms of its influence on actual kind of political activity. So all sorts of people read the book and tried to set up like Bellamyite communities. Reading it now, there are lots of things about it which are charming. The year 2000 has all kinds of Victorian carryover. Yeah, that, yeah women yeah. still wear bustles. Yeah, <laughs> like kind of society has been turned on its head, but, uh, you know, the top hat is still in. Yeah, so Bellamy himself is the socialist of his time, but the protagonist is not. He is a rich man of the late 19th century. An idol rich man. The book begins with this image of the, co- of the society as the kind of coach and there are the people who pull the coach along and there are people who ride on the top and he is one of those who ride on the top. He's a well-off, educated Bostonian who lives on inherited wealth. He's a young man and he's looking to get married. He's engaged, but he can't get married because his very grand house is in an area which has become poor and full of tenements. He's building for himself a much grander house in a smart, fancy area. And then when he can move in, he can finally get married. And he can't because builders are continually striking. And he's like, oh, these terrible strikers, a plague on them. They are interfering with my future marital bliss. Perhaps I can do no better than to compare society as it then was to a prodigious coach which the masses of humanity were harnessed to and dragged toilsomely along a very hilly and sandy road. The driver was hunger and permitted no lagging, though the pace was necessarily very slow. Despite the difficulty of drawing the coach at all along so hard a road, the top was covered with passengers who never got down, even at the steepest ascents. These seats on top were very breezy and comfortable. Both he and his betrothed are very much like nervous metropolitan types. They're both incredibly anxious and they're both kind of incredibly sort of overstimulated. But the main thing that's going on is they're like sort of feverishly reading nothing in the newspapers. But society is obviously kind of like really creaky and on the verge of collapse. You know, the trusts are they're taking over everything. And, uh, and the workers, they're just striking and striking and striking and nothing can be done. But it's the idea that this sort of America that's like capitalism is in its kind of like Marxian about to like implode itself kind yeah, of yeah, state yeah. It's teetering yeah. on the edge like trusts are like big sort of cartels effectively aren't they they're, they're conglomerate yeah yeah like the most famous example I think is probably Standard Oil where Standard Oil was producing oil refining oil and transporting it it's where you get these great deal magnates or each banking crash allows a few people to like consolidate enormously or yeah this. and there was a lot of worry about this and then also there's a background of kind of social unrest and i guess the big political movement here is also there's there's kind of socialism and there's also anarchism i would say the 19th century anarchists if they have a clear set of goals it's that the natural order of humanity is sort of brotherly love and cooperation and that a group of conniving elites are holding down human development and human brotherly love. And all we've got to do is kill them, kill the elites, and then the whole system will collapse and we will have brotherly love and cooperation, which will invigorate the economy like we're going to be free of want and free of tyranny. They were not all quite that wide-eyed and sort of silly, but they're famous for chucking bombs at politicians because if you kill enough of them the political class will be sufficiently weakened that it will no longer be able to hold back the natural order of things, which is much better than the way things are now. And they were pretty active. It was a real era of political assassinations and things. Anyway, that is a bit of a tangent. Well, I think it's important because he talks about them. This sense of kind of a society of, of strife. The kind of protagonist, Julian West, yeah, he's super kind of overstimulated metropolitan type. He's sort of lying on Freud's couch and is being theorised by various people at the time. Um, And that, in his case, manifests as insomnia. So he's completely unable to sleep. And he's had to take all of these elaborate measures in order to be able to get a night's rest. One of which is that he's moved his bedroom into essentially a kind of nuclear bunker, kind of shut out all of the noise to be perfectly dark. It's only one thing that can really motivate the body to extraordinary powers. Animal magnetism, mesmerism. So he has a quack doctor who comes to do this this kind of um, yeah kind of magnetic hypnosis on him. Yeah, probably using Vril. Yes, and that's what he does. Uh, and then he comes in the morning again to wake him up. Yes, his trusty black man servant, but it uses a different term. Sawyer wakes him up in the morning because he's a very um, a loyal and adept young man. Has been taught taught how to undo the uh, the mesmerism. But he's uh, upon waking. 
he's woken up by this by this unfamiliar. He's in a funny room. He wakes up and he's in a funny room. And he first hears voices. Yes, and uh, characteristically, as this is a utopia, there is a kind of a glimpse, or at least the sound, of a beautiful woman. There are two voices. There is the sound of a beautiful woman's voice, whatever that sounds like. Melodious, yeah. There's normally an authoritative older man as well. Sort of patrician and fatherly. That's Those are normally the two really key uh, Yeah, and that's, do- that's Dr. Leet and Edith Leet his daughter and dr leet is going to usher him into this new world it's him who we heard being addressed in the quotation at the start of the program and guess what he's been asleep for 100 and oh, 117 years or whatever 13 years this sort of funny was sort of pseudoscientific idea that quasi hypnosis might might arrest the body in a state of suspended animation is around in there's a Poe story where it happens. Again, it's rather scientifically old hat by the 1880s when there actually there was some science going on. But it's the same thing as Frill. It's this idea that there is something between electromagnetism. There's some sort of unknown thing that we don't quite get that links together the life force, magnetism, hypnosis, and it's the motivating force of life. And these mesmerists are sort of, they don't quite understand what they're doing, but they're somehow fiddling around and tweaking with it. And it's somehow locked the body into a trance, which has also preserved it. So nothing has happened. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the rest of the story then, he's in this, um, he's in this new world. Uh, we've heard his kind of um, outraged arrival. And then he's, but he doesn't stay outraged for very long. The leets are very solicitous, particularly young Edith. This is true. In, in the future, by the way, um, everyone is polite. This is true in all of these futures. Everyone is remarkably polite. They will always say... I hope you don't think I'm rude. Do say if I'm being too intrusive. And that's sort of what, in all of the utopias, there's quite a lot of that. The rest of the book essentially unfolds along two axes, one of which is the protagonist gradually becoming informed about this new world. In long sort of political speeches by Dr. Leet, which account for probably 75% of the book. And uh, the other, which is um, he and Edith gradually realising that they're madly in love with each other and have to get married. Then there's a little and then there's a little bit of plot. Like looking backwards, although I think it has been slightly unjustly written off, that you can see why people are a little bit condescending about its status as literature, because a lot of the chapters are just the narrator asking a couple of questions and then Dr. Leet talking for about three thousand words on a particular subject. <laughs> maybe I'll read a maybe I'll read a quick quotation. So he says, Since you were in the humour to talk rather than sleep as I certainly am, perhaps I can do no better than to give you enough idea of our modern industrial system to dissipate at least the impression that there is any mystery about the process of its evolution. The Bostonians of your day had the reputation of being great askers of questions, and I am going to show my dissent by asking you one to begin with. What should you name as the most prominent feature of the labour troubles of your day? Why, the strikes, of course, I replied. Exactly. But what made the strikes so formidable? The great labour organisations. And what was the motive of those great organisations? The workmen claimed they had to organise to get their rights from the big corporations, I replied. That is just it, said Dr Leet. The organisation of the labour and the strikes were in effect merely of the concentration of capital in greater masses than had ever been known before. Before this concentration began dot 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 and it continues then for like about 10 pages. And then there's 30,000 words on, on how all of this has been solved. Would it be possible to describe a bit of the physical conditions he finds in the room and out of the window just at the beginning. He wakes up and he is taken to a drawing room and it's exactly the same. And he says, nothing has changed. All the furniture and the stuff people have in their houses is essentially exactly the same, except they have a few extra gadgets. The fashions are exactly the same. The like aesthetic conditions are exactly the same. It's just that there's more material prosperity and some extra gadgets. And I think that's important to say that it's sort of positing... Like, it's incredibly important for him that a huge change will happen, but there will essentially be a complete conservation of mores. Yeah, so I think that one of the things which this, and also some of the other utopias we'll talk about, does, is that it proposes as its utopia the universalization of a particular existing contemporary condition. And I would say that that is the condition of, a, like a well-off bourgeois professional is the archetype. It's like being a well-off sort of lawyer or doctor. Yeah in the 19th century. Everyone gets to live, not in extreme wealth, but the 
good wealth and without any of the neuroses that are infecting the 19th yeah, century, yeah, which is yeah. a fairly neurotic age. And we'll, we'll kind of get into what that implies in terms of a material culture or, a, uh, you know, all sort of spaces or and sociability is what and a, things. A, a, a middle sort of bourgeois Victorian wanted to be, thought they were, because they're all paragons of virtue. So I, want, I think we need to describe the, the economic system, which I think is the, the big invention of the book. One of the things that we learn early on is that in this society, prosperity has been kind of achieved and universalized through the state management of all industry. There is basically a state organization, which they call the industrial army. So all production is managed by this enormous like infrastructure. Basically, pretty much everyone works in it for some part of their lives everyone kind of is found an ideal job you're allowed to apply, apply for anything that you want there's kind of freedom but there's also an idea that you very naturally get sifted into a role that is specifically good for you there is a real sense of that kind of idea of like military virtue as well there are all sorts of grades there are all sorts of like subclasses there are lots of there are lots of badges there's a pretty strict officer man division he says there's only one organisation in the 19th century which inspires the commitment of people without reward and which is perfectly organised and which is a beautiful model of cooperation and that is conscription armies. There's the conscription army. Everyone is going to be conscripted into the army and the army is going to do all the work and instead of there being lots of trusts, all the economy has been collectivised into one Trust, Trust. which is owned by the people. Yeah, which is owned by the state. I mean, the other part of this is that everyone gets paid. Everyone gets, essentially, you know, their dividend from the the state trust. Everyone, and everyone gets the same. Babies, the retired, whatever you're doing, like, you don't get paid. Everyone gets a state stipend, which is the same. And you, you draw on it with your credit card. Which is more like a ration book. So there are all sorts of different jobs. One of the ideas that he has is that necessarily there will be jobs which are dangerous or hard or unpleasant and that they will have to attract applicants through other means so that they will have a very short work day. They will change their kind of conditions in a way that will... Everybody works from the age of 21 to 45-ish. You can have a break for kids and you can extend it with various sort of funny activities, but you don't actually get paid at all for your work. Everyone gets paid for being human regardless. And the way that they attract people to undesirable jobs is you can work for fewer hours. But also there's just terrific esprit de corps. Theoretically, you can be compelled to work, but no one actually has to be because everyone wants to work. Everyone wants to do something, and so they do the thing which they want to do. The workday, in any case, is short, and everyone retires at 45. There are various complicated systems for how people pursue careers which are in the cultural sphere, which are a bit too complicated and annoying to go into. The way that things in that kind of very broadly defined sphere of culture work is broadly they work on subscription so that newspapers work because enough people subscribe to them and it's very important that there is no class everyone is sort of upper middle class there's this sort of episode which is important where later on they'll go to have dinner somewhere there's like a waiter there and he's very impressed by the kind of martial bearing uh, of this young waiter did you read the footnote to the waiter there's a footnote an asterisk which is i've heard of some of the university folks from from so and so having tried at waitering in the summer for those of the who are and it didn't do them any harm at all <laughs> Well, I guess I guess at the time, I guess he is sort of pushing against the extremely strong, uh, like nineteenth-century class prejudice against against the these servile occupations. I think that this whole like kind of military idea is all very, um, it's very picturesque in a way, isn't it? You know, all of these funny sort everyone's of grades. Everyone's got their ranks. Everyone's got their ranks and their grades and their uniforms. So they're all very proud of their badges and their yeah, work of the month badges. It's seriously, it's yeah. it's got that like kind of tragic communist hat economy when you can't actually like discriminate very much between workers you know with like pay or anything honor is the only thing which still exists in this society so everyone is hungry for it and all the girls are beautiful because they're well they're properly fed yeah and they're tall as well tall and beautiful tall and strong so everyone gets the same stuff everyone is provided for you know the top ranks of the army are are kind of elected on merit from within the army it's not democracy. No, not elected. It's like the Chinese Communist Party. They're kind of like, they're like pushed up by 
cadres. They, yeah, there's a sort of selectorate of some kind that yeah. that, pu- that pushes them up. And those people don't retire at 45. They kind of go on into their into their 60s. Yeah, and become the judges and magistrates. This is what there is, is a sort of natural aristocracy of the capable. Yeah, merit aristocracy. Merit. Which is a tautology, of course, but, you know. An idea any right-thinking person should be naturally suspicious of. (laughs) (laughs) A self-appointed group of people who believe themselves to be intellectually and morally superior to everyone else. And now, a brief interlude from our sponsors. The Great Courses Plus. Yes, the Great Courses Plus is an online streaming learning service where you can continue your lifelong quest to learn as much as you can about the world around you which you've obviously begun by listening to our well, podcast yeah, why else would you be here so you can learn about topics like history astronomy archaeology literature art learning a language cooking anything you want really any other good it's all things there. they've got thousands of courses thousands of lectures all presented by top experts who are passionate about what they teach and you can watch them however you want, on any schedule, from anywhere. That's the internet, isn't it? So we've been enjoying their brand new course, The Architecture of Power, Great Palaces of the Ancient World. Well, it takes you through a series of particularly ancient, as in sort of pre-medieval palaces, the architecture. Yes, especially those of the Roman world feature pretty heavily. There's a lot of very good ones in there. The Golden House of Nero, the Palace of Hadrian, the Palace of Diocletian at Split, which is now rebuilt on the scale of a city and you can find out all about them the people who made them and some great reconstructions because all these things are rather missing now but what do they need to do in order to do that yeah well we know you are going to love the great courses plus and to help you get started they are offering you our listeners a special time limited offer a full free month of unlimited access but to get that you need to sign up through our special url which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash buildings. The gr- the great courses plus dot com slash buildings. Why wouldn't you do it? It's free. It's a whole month. So thanks very much to them for sponsoring our show. And now back to the podcast. Should we talk a little bit about this idea? Because it kind of it seems to express this real excitement about the potential of the machine age the labour-saving capacity of, like, industrial production, and also the way in which these ever-larger organisations of industrial capital and workforce could be, you know, deployed for utopian ends. As I said, there's those two innovations. One, everyone's going to be an inspired worker because it's going to be like the army, and everyone's going to be equal, and so work is going to be good and people are going to be motivated because instead of being servile... But also, there's going to be one trust, which means that there's not going to be competition... There's going to be universal cooperation, because that's what happens with natural monopolies. There's going to be all this wealth because of these efficiencies, all the inefficiencies due to strife within the capitalist system are going to be taken out. Uh, this is a real era of crises of over- overproduction, when they were very kind of starkly apparent. In It's this kind of laissez-faire rapid growth, where you have these big, it's real boom and bust capitalism that was going on at the time. But by the state managing all distribution... You don't. There's only one shop. Everyone goes to Taco Bell, like yeah. in, um, <laughs> you know, Demolition Man or whatever. <laughs> the franchise wars have happened. There is one company. It's and it got sells, one shop. It sells everything. It sells everything. There's one restaurant. There is one shop. By doing that, like, you cut out all the waste. And it knows exactly what everyone wants to buy, so it can provide it to them. Although I said everyone goes to Taco Bell, obviously you can have whatever you want in this magical you know, in the the restaurant's got whatever you want in it. There's just one of them. So, shall we do a few little descriptions of everyday life and kind of take people into this this sort of strange mirror, nineteenth century mirror world of uh, of looking backwards? So, it's not like nineteenth century Boston. So, the inside of the houses is very similar. Grandfather clocks, wood paneling, nice carpets, yeah. bustles. Um, outside, it's kind of like I think broadly what they imagined a perfect city to be like. Broad and clean thoroughfares. Not a bit of horse dust around. He sort of describes it as, looking at it from above, there are these big broad rows lined with stately trees. There are glistening metal statues everywhere. There are public buildings which are not described very much, but where they are described, they are 
sort of domes poking out of this kind of mesh of stately houses. And there are fountains everywhere. Yeah, lots so of fountains. So we have fountains, yeah. trees, glittering statues, broad roads. Sp- space. Uh, space and domed sort of palaces of the people scattered yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think they're all made of stone. They're all kind of like properly built. And um, they've all adorned with beautiful like decorative friezes. Yeah, a lot of narrative ornament and the people are very proud of the decorative friezes people will come and look at a new decorative frieze that's been put up and i'm sure all of the other sorts of 19th century decorations is it like the leeds corn exchange or what's the building in leeds which is a big dome beautiful big dome painted ceiling yeah these kind of enormous light filled by the way super cool uh if you're I will let. I think we'll, I'll try and put some stuff on Instagram. It's- yeah, it's a super cool building, the Leeds Corn Exchange. Leeds has got some really good 19th century buildings. They also have various mod cons in the streets. So there's a description of when during a, a storm, this enormous awning is uh, placed over the whole street so people don't get their hair wet. An important point is made that during the 19th century, those who could afford one would have their own umbrella. But in the dawn of the 21st, there's one umbrella for the whole of society. Here we are at the store of our ward, said Edith, as we turned in at the great portal of one of the magnificent public buildings I had observed in my morning walk. There was nothing in the interior aspect of the edifice to suggest a store to a representative of the 19th century. There was no display of goods in the great windows or any device to advertise wares or attract custom nor was there any sort of sign or legend on the front of the building to indicate the character of the business carried on there, but instead above the portal, standing out from the front of the building, a majestic life-size group of statuary, the central figure of which was a female ideal of plenty with her cornucopia. Judging from the composition of the throng passing in and out, about the same proportion of the sexes among shoppers obtained as in the 19th century. As we entered, Edith said that there was one of these great distributing establishments in every ward of the city, so that no residence was more than five or ten minutes' walk from one of them. It was the first interior of a 20th century public building that I had ever beheld, and the spectacle naturally impressed me deeply. I was in a vast hall, full of light, received not alone from windows on all sides, but from the dome, the point of which was a hundred feet above. Beneath it, in the centre of the hall, a magnificent fountain played, cooling the atmosphere to a delicious freshness with its spray. The walls and ceilings were frescoes in mellow tints, calculated to soften without absorbing the light which flooded the interior. Around the fountain was a space occupied with chairs and sofas, on which many persons were seated conversing. Legends on the walls, all about the hall, indicated to what classes of commodities the counters below were devoted. Edith directed her steps toward one of these, where samples of muslin of a bewildering variety were displayed and proceeded to inspect them. I mean, it's probably the, like, richest description. They're not super rich, but they're, they're very strangely kind of displaced in, in history, aren't they? The way that the shops work is as they are all sample stores. Yeah. So that uh, you, this counter, as with all of them, you know, the whole shop will sell thousands and thousands and millions of commodities of different kinds. You can buy anything and you can order anything from anywhere and you say, I want that, and then it's delivered to your house. Yeah, by pneumatic tube. So everyone has got pneumatic tubes. You see these samples. Like, there's not really very much staffing in this sample store. So there's one shop, everyone goes to it, and you can order any kind of thing. It seems to me that she's still... That she fills a certain amount of her time with making clothes. Uh, she takes them to a tailor. Oh, okay, yeah. So she orders up her calicos and muslins, and then um, there's like the state dressmaker. Oh, right, and you go and get your dresses made. So you don't buy you don't buy ready to wear has not been no it's not it's not a big the, thing in, yet. The, it's in the twenty first century frightfully yeah. declassé yeah <laughs> and everyone gets the bourgeois life so yeah. they don't have to put up yeah. with any like ready maids. So I mean the the system works by. Like, everyone is, except in the really most extraordinarily rural backwaters, everyone is connected by pneumatic tubes. And you order the things up, and by the time you get home, there's parcels waiting for you, which have been delivered through your pneumatic tube of what you wanted. So it's like Argos, except that it's got a pneumatic tube going into your house. 
Okay, so here's the description. They go to the central warehouse, which is this sort of distribution. I found the processes at the warehouse quite as interesting as Edith had described them, and became even enthusiastic over the truly remarkable illustration, which is seen there, of the prodigiously multiplied efficiency which perfect organisation can give yeah, to labour. Yeah, by the way, my God, like for every little bit of colour, there's an awful lot of... Um, <laughs> there's an awfully long exposition on the new political economy. It is like a gigantic mill into the hopper of which goods are constantly being poured by the train load and ship load to issue at the other end in packages of pounds and ounces, yards and inches, pints and gallons, corresponding to the infinitely complex personal needs of half a million people. Dr. Leet, with the assistance of data furnished by me as to the way goods were sold in my day, figured out some astonishing results in the way of the economies affected by the modern system. But what of, Luke, the hours of repose? Yeah, I think we should talk about the dinner party and we should talk about the home. Maybe we should talk about the dinner party first. So yeah. this is one of the big outings that they go on. Between between long, long and tiring political chats, they go out for dinner at the dining house. They go out for dinner at the dining house because that is the only way to obtain food. Been a huge saving of labour because no cooking is ever done at home. You can only you can only obtain food in the dining house. I think you can get food elsewhere. Yeah. I don't think you have to eat in the dining house, but they they because they describe it as a kind of a special thing to go to the dining house. Ah, oh, no. Otherwise, your food is sent to you in pneumatic tubes from the dining house. I think. Yeah. Well. The, yeah. So the, the the dining house is something which they've taken up by subscription. And it's that, you know, not everyone has one of these. You have to pay a little fee from your credit book and you rent a dining room complete with staff in the enormous dining house building. I thought one of the things was they didn't have a kitchen because they were getting rid of female drudgery. Uh, I'm sure they've done that, but I think that you can still eat at home. I think when they eat at home, their food is sent to them. The dining house is interesting because it's... The dining house is this prodigiously large building... It's like a building with 8,000 rooms or something in it. It's like one of those huge um, American hotels that were built around the same time that would have... We're a thousand-room hotel. Yeah. You know, these huge things that were built in New York and I expect in other places as well. The way that it works is that, you know, they're all numbered and you have one. And it's a little bit like having a safety deposit box, except that it's a dining room. You can go there and have dinner... All of the rooms are like a grand dining room from a fancy sort of bourgeois house of the period. You know, they're, they're all like in this building, which is a pile of 8,000 of them. It's a courtyard and there's glittering fountains. Yeah. And there's sort of grand, it's a bit like going to the opera is the way I imagined it. Like, and everyone's got their box. You rent your own dining room, but no one like, they don't use, one person doesn't use someone else's dining room. No, you have your own one, which is kind of strange. They're not shared. At least as described. Why? Seems a bit wasteful to me. It's wasteful Given that you have to book it in in advance. Yeah. You, you have to of, book in advance. Yeah. You wonder why you wouldn't just you have to book use in advance, a, a generic pay. one. You're wasted by staff, but everyone's got their own permanent room. Yeah, I don't know. That's Those are, those are just kind of bourgeois scruples, aren't they? I guess you want to have your own one. Is that That's like a sort of pr- privacy thing? You wouldn't want someone eating in the same place as you? I don't know. It's a str- it is a f- it's a funny kind of contradictory idea. He wants to explain this sort of luxury communism mm-hmm. thing called, by the way, called like na- nationalism. Nationalism, yeah, it's called nationalism, um, which refers to the fact that everything is going to be nationalised. He doesn't want to put anyone off by saying anything's going to change. Really, like everyone's lifestyle is just going to be like the best that they could imagine at the same time. Uh, but society is going to change in such a way that this is going to be possible for everybody. But then he just, like, whenever he can, he doesn't, he sort of steers away from something that might, like, upset the horses. That's just, that's the kind of lifestyle that is is the best one imaginable, is the one of being yeah. being prosperous. The kind of things that prosperous people have are achieved for everyone. And, you know, when he describes education, which we don't really need to go into, but it's described as that everyone has the education of a gentleman. But without the waste and flummery. And they get a kind of liberal education. They get an education that's not necessarily all useful. They, like, are deliberately educated with stuff. The education is deliberately not necessarily useful at all. And then you get on-the-job tra- training for your actual work. Yeah, it's the idea is that it, that everyone should be educated because society will be better. And then there are just lots of little details which are kind of which are kind of fun. There's so the this sense of uh, an infrastructure uh, is rather charming. They have... 
a system whereby, you know, it's Spotify essentially, but it's conceived as that there are 12 or like 20 orchestras constantly playing different wonderful pieces and you can get the music piped into your into any room in your house. Yes, the kind of musical tubes. And they play on a sort of 24-hour rotation. Yet yeah, he, he sort of has a theory about art as well, doesn't he? The kind of art and literature. They've had to reinvent... The novel has had to be reinvented, essentially, for... They still appreciate Dickens. Yes. Because they appreciate the way in which he is sort of responding to social conditions in the present. He's feeling homesick, and they take him to the library, and there's Tennyson and... Um... But for the most part, literature has had to be reinvented for the new utopia. That, and they are these wonderful. He talks about how like wonderful these uh, these new novels are and how they move him. But they're a completely new thing. Yeah, the artwork is a problem in these all these utopias. But again, last time we didn't talk about the artwork in Vril and the artwork in Erewhon. In Vril, new good art is impossible because the society is perfect and art sort of thrives on competition or something in everyone there's an there's a theory of like art like the machine has become subject to evolution so they you have these kind of ecosystem bubbles and crashes and things they'll make lots of it and then they'll destroy it all and these kind of oh yeah, yeah. That, there's, there's also the, fu- the, the public sculptures is very important yeah where, where there, like, there are these ways where, like of... people are so fed up of public sculptures littering the place that they pay the sculptor to make it but then Just on the presu- no it. on the presumption that they will not make it they're sort of paid to make it and then paid not to make it. And there is something of a problem that um, sometimes the artists pay not to make it and give some of the money back to get the commission. I wanted to say something about women. I would say that Bellamy's intention is to describe a society in which women would be emancipated, but that he is bumping up a bit on the limits of his own imagination and on his own kind of prejudices, which he can't quite get out of. So in terms of the industrial army and, the, you know, women re- are equal citizens, they receive the same money, they also work in the industrial army, but where his ability, where his kind of imagination runs out, the final step that he can't take is that he can't imagine them being equal partners in the direction of society. When he describes the place of women within the society and he also sort of describes how the industrial army is run there's always one woman on the council and her responsibility is for all the women in the industrial army they are kind of participants in it in full but they also like they can't run it they can't be they can't be part they're separate and slightly inferior women's system of government which then uh, it allow, is allowed one cabinet member, basically. Yeah, there's a sort of female bantistan of, yeah. yeah, within the industrial army. Because women are separate, a separate sort of thing, and they will be much happier if it's only women engaging in women's affairs. Well, yeah, I feel my feeling is that there is a, like a good intention, but which is kind of, which is unable to make a series of quite essential critical uh, leaps. To be fair, like if you want to, if you want to get like, if you want good attitudes, don't read 19th century books. Yeah, yeah. In fact, don't read books from the distant past at all. They all have terrible attitudes. This is much better than most. But times have moved on. They've moved on from the past. The other big area that he has difficulty with, I think, that's that's a kind of slightly a crime of commission that he can't imagine like women and men can't imagine participating a woman, a woman, in equal terms. Yeah, yeah, a woman being in charge of the industrial army. Yeah, That sort of equality. And in the home... It is women who take time off and look after children exclusively and women do all the womenly housework such as it is, it is which has been enormously reduced by um, communal organisation and the, you know, all the cooking's been done by the um, collective kitchens and stuff. But he, cannot, he can't even imagine that it would be any other way. Actually, this one I would say is kind of more conservative in some ways than some of the other ones with... Certainly, and its, its aesthetics are conservative, and that's one of the things which is, makes it rather charming, is that it's kind of politically revolutionary and aesthetically very sort of picturesquely conservative. He's also really serious. He's totally, earnestly serious that he wants this. I'm sure if you said to him, like, on any point of detail... He would he would be happy to concede lots of things, but he would say that broadly speaking, we're being held back. The system is collectivism. I mean, the future is collectivism. The the struck the competitive structure is bad. Competition's bad. Cooperation is good, which is something um it's easy to sympathise with. Probably not necessarily quite right. 
Oh, I don't know. We'll see. Time will tell. So I want to say something about the end of this book, because I think that... There's a bit of plot at the end. There's a little bit of plot at the beginning, and then there's a very thin smattering through the middle, and then there's a bit of plot at the end. There is wandering exposition for most of the book. Yeah, and then at the end, they fall in love, or they realise that they were always in love. It's been strongly hinted at, basically all the way through. So what happens is that, yeah, they're they're betrothed, him and young Edith. Who who is, um, like, the great great-granddaughter of the person he was going to get married to anyway, so it's all all right. Which is a very bizarre little bit of info. So there's this moment of, uh, like, wonderful fulfilment, and they've fallen in love, and they're going to get married, and that's all very happy. And um, and then he goes to bed, and he falls asleep, and he, he's woken up by his man, Sawyer, and he's back in the basement. The whole thing has been a dream. And he Sawyer's so, so made him his usual breakfast and brought him some newspapers. Yeah. And he's horrified. He's so sad. He's horrified. He goes out into the What's world. What's in those newspapers? All, you know, awful things. Hanging. Murder. Corruption. Yeah. And he goes out into 19th century Boston horrified and he's in this kind of delirium of grief, really, of grief and revulsion. All these ugly people in hideous rags. And he kind of goes everywhere. He sees all of the signs of this iniquitous society, and the poverty, the exploitation. And it kind of ends with him going to this dinner at which he makes himself incredibly disagreeable because yeah, he can he says, no longer be part of it. Don't you see? Our way of life is iniquitous. And he eventually is, like, thrown out. Yeah, he's thrown out and everyone laughs at him. But then... He wakes up again, and it, that was all a dream. That was all a dream, and actually he's going to get happily ever after and get married. But, oh, but thank no, God for that. He's not going to, but not happily ever after, because what what the thing, what I think it, it achieves, this kind of double folding over on itself, is that actually the ending is that he wakes up in utopia, but with kind of the guilt of the survivor, the kind of moral ambiguity of the person who's stumbled into utopia. It's a, a sort of manoeuvre of real genius in terms of narrative, this like double dream the double dream waking up because what that focuses your mind on is exactly on this juxtaposition exactly on this border between the imagined world and the real one he sort of says everyone is guilty through inaction and it's sort of the ambiguity of the act of kind of like utopian imagination as well which in some ways is a sort of self-indulgent thing and in other ways is freighted with this this like impetus towards political action or change yeah i don't feel it's too self-indulgent i think it's actually i think we're too stuck now we're too unadventurous. Bellamy, in a way, has this slightly sad life. So he wrote this in his 40s, and he was, at the time, a journalist. And I don't think he was all that successful. He was, like, sort of a nobody and kind of a bit provincial. And he suddenly became incredibly famous and incredibly successful. And then he very shortly afterwards died of tuberculosis. And that's that's kind of his life. And there's a good article by him, which is called, like, How I Came to Write Looking Backwards. I mean, I think in his lifetime, the fact that he died, or like after his lifetime, really gave it another kick as well. You know, whatever else it is, it's like totally in earnest, you know, and it's kind of a really sincere attempt to think through how you would build this kind of heaven on earth. He is really pushing at the limits of his own like imagination in some ways, like to try and to try and imagine this thing. And however, however problematic the kind of limits that he bumps up against. And he's really trying to work it through earnestly and seriously. He's seriously, whereas um, the first two, Erewhon and Vril are putting a mirror up to society and trying to point out its hypocrisies and um, where obvious things could be better. This is really genuine, genu- genuinely a manifesto, and he's really tried to work out how to make it work. In the article where he says how I came to write it, he describes the process of writing it, which is that first he said wanted to write a book about an ideal, his vision of an ideal society, and he wanted to set it in 3,000. It was going to have an awful lot more plot and description of places, and he kind of wrote that. But he thought that the, the, the description of place and the plot was frivolous. And so he said he cut it down to the absolute minimum. And he says, I, won- I worry that it is n- not even will not even pass for the minimum to hold people's interest. Because he thought it was a distraction from the important stuff. And then he said he moved it forward because he said to make it believable that it could be achieved. And you can see there the, uh, how the earnestness is kind of triumphing. But I really think it would have been good. I think it's better to set it in 2000, 3000, but I think having a little bit more yeah. substance is a, 
It's a hell of a tease, isn't it? Yeah, I love the places. They're so funny. Like, you could put all the writing on of the places in, like, four A4 pages. The rhetoric is clumsy. It is, but it's not as... I mean, it's a lot better than John Ruskin. It's very kind of reasonable. It's all... The affect is, like, very reasonable. Yeah. And I think that's how it's meant to be. It's got a kind of fireside chat feel to it. I think you're you're meant to be won over by Dr. Leet, and an awful lot of people were. Yeah. This was successful. The two books here that were successful were this and Vril. They yeah. really sold. <laughs> Which is pretty unlike each other. Although. Yeah, that's kind of so, so <laughs> bizarre. Both of them, nowadays, you they're really strange. That, like, neither of these books would get a look in now. No, no. So for the last part of the programme, we want to talk about a couple of books which appear in response to Looking Backwards. So because of its success was and its kind of stature was sufficient to provoke all sorts of people both positively and negatively and a relatively prompt and unfavorable response came in the form of William Morris's News from Nowhere. So Morris who we discussed at greater length on one of our I think on the third of our Ruskin episodes is um, you know a very big figure in you know late 19th century. Popular now still. And this book is actually much better known now I think most people who've heard of this book probably haven't heard of the book that it was prompted in response to. And people like it, right? I mean, we should say that to start with, uh, and we can discuss why once we've kind of, um, why we think that is. So the the book begins with the kind of scenario, this Morris-like figure. It says, up at the League, there had been one night a brisk conversational discussion as to what would happen on the morrow of the revolution. And we, we should imagine this Morris-like figure up at his uh, Socialist League meeting, I think, arguing disputing well it's got a joke there's very few don't make many jokes in this book in fact in or in looking backwards but it has a joke which is that it all went off relatively well and although no one listened to each other at least they didn't talk over each other yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah, were yeah. using they were using the downtime usefully to work out what they were going to say he's sort of a bit dispirited by it all but he's also filled with this incredible desire to see the revolution and to see the kind of post-revolutionary society realised. And he's saying, oh, if I could but see a day of it, if I, th- if I could but see it. Well, he feels that the meeting is positive, but kind of it feels like it's not making contact. It's not They're not making any progress. So he says, um, having said goodnight very amicably, he took his way home by himself to a western suburb, using the means of travelling which civilization has forced upon us like a habit. As he sat in that vapour bath of hurried and discontented humanity, a carriage of the underground railway, he, like the others, stewed discontentedly, while in self-reproachful mood he turned over the many excellent and conclusive arguments which, though they lay at his fingers' ends, he had forgotten in the just past discussion. So he's kind of, yeah, he's rehearsing all of the things which he should have said. And uh, just like the protagonist of Looking Backwards, he's going to fall asleep and wake up in a new world. But it's it's interestingly that rather, it's interesting, I think, that rather than having a kind of scientific miracle, you know, or pseudo-scientific miracle that takes him into the future, it's purely, purely energised by this desire. This kind of desire to see the future mysteriously kind of magics him into it. This one has no psychology and no science. Looking Backwards is interested in a psychological assessment of the protagonist, but it is interested in his various stages of coming to terms. He has to be won over. And once he's won over, he he feels like frustration, guilt. These complex emotions. Whereas the the protagonist of News From Nowhere awakes after the revolution of his dreams and is just somewhat disoriented and bewildered by... By, by the kind of the life that he finds there. And what does he do to start with? He gets up out of his house and he um, bubbles down to the river and feels that he should. he's feeling a little groggy and he's going to go for a plunge, a quick swim in the Thames. Must have been a jolly daring thing to do in, in, at the turn of the century. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be foaming and possibly on fire? <laughs> but everything has been wonderfully transformed. Well, he meets, he meets a water boatman who's in a sort of giant bathtub coracle thing which and again so far everything is kind of similar except the Thames is gloriously clear don't you think it's very clear at this time oh I wouldn't I wouldn't say so it is on the ebb tide you know the silt and there's something else that's funny that the boatman is remarkably well dressed he's got a 
gilded damascene buckle on his belt. Like, the future is full of outrageous fops, in essence. He was a handsome young fellow with a peculiarly pleasant and friendly look about his eyes, an expression which was quite new to me then, though I soon became familiar with it. For the rest, he was dark-haired and berry brown of skin, well-knit and strong, and obviously used to exercising his muscles, but with nothing rough or coarse about him, and as clean as might be. His dress was not like any modern workaday clothes I had seen, but would have served very well as a costume for a picture of 14th century life. It was of dark blue cloth, simple enough, but of fine web, and without a stain on it. He had a brown leather belt around his waist, and I noticed that its clasp was of damascened steel, beautifully wrought. So it starts with this boat ride down the Thames, and very quickly on the boat ride, he starts to notice all of the things which are different about London. Essentially, he sort of notices that there's an awful lot more beautiful forests and things. A lot less London than he remembers. Nature has taken over. The soap works with their smoke vomiting chimneys were gone. The engineers works gone. The lead works gone. And no sound of riveting and hammering came down the west wind from Thornycroft's. Then the bridge. I had perhaps dreamed of such a bridge, but never seen such a one out of an illuminated manuscript. Not even the Ponte Vecchio at Florence came anywhere near it. It was of stone arches, splendidly solid, and as graceful as they were strong, high enough also to let ordinary river traffic through easily. Over the parapet showed quaint and fanciful little buildings, which I supposed to be booths or shops, beset with painted and gilded veins and spirelets. The stone was a little weathered, but showed no marks of the grimy sootiness, which I was used to on every London building more than a year old. So what he's imagining there basically is old London Bridge kind of fantastically upped. Yeah, fantastically kind of clean and delightful. The other thing which is going on is that there's also an awful lot more nature. London seems to have kind of dispersed, but also become this sort of medieval fantasy. It seems to be like medieval London. Well, the reason I th- so the, the, there was the old bridge which was built in the 12th century um, and then had was covered in sort of shops and chapels and whatnot um, and gaudy palaces and in fact was very unreliable and there's a reason there's a song London Bridge is falling down. Yes, it's weird isn't it? It's, it's like it's not quite like anything you can imagine. Much haler and heartier and rather like the Middle Ages. Rather like the Middle Ages but a much better version. They're not huddled behind an enormous wall. Rather the city like interpenetrated by this broad majestic forests. It's funny he says forests all the time but he never kind of goes in them. He's looking at the forest from the outside it's not the schwarzwald of grimm's fairy tales no it's a very safe forest should we outline the plot really quickly yeah i mean just to say that the the book in common with looking backwards is a kind of walking exposition he's found by a man isn't he and then taken to see his uncle who lives in the british museum and knows about all the old things and then you get the like political exposition and the political exposition is We now live in a socialist utopia. We've destroyed all, nearly all the machines, which were all counterproductive anyway. And because there's no machines, the economy is booming. The structures of government which exist are kind of like, they are like assemblies. They're called moots, which just means meeting in Old English. A couple of things do happen. I would like to go through the story a little bit more, in a little bit more depth, because I had some thoughts about it. I think I got on with it more than you did. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I'll say some things that I sort of how I saw them and then you can respond there's that long exposition sort of intercut with this young couple relatively young couple the man he met and a woman and they're coming together again having she'd left him and it's explained that, that society seems to go on in a different way it's kind of powered by love or something like that it's almost as important as any of this discussion, there's a long discussion of like how the revolution came about, and the revolution is going to be violent, and it's unlike Bellamy. He disagrees with Bellamy. He thinks that the system is going to resist. He does this kind of history of how the revolution came about, and it came about through like uprising, civil war. The significant mechanism is general strike, so that the proletariat gets together and they they have like a, a big strike and that's really what is able to turn the tables on the forces of government but there is a big civil war after that and then there's a long civil war which um destroys most of the country and the economy they don't have to really knock down much of london because it's all been destroyed in this terrible civil war and then after this terrible civil war they'll rebuild 
society on the perfect model from scratch. In a way, but, and, a, and there's some sort of description of how the political model works. I mean, which frankly is sort of silly. It's, it's m- much less well thought out than Bellamy. If we're on this subject, we should say that the way that the world of work happens is that people basically do what they feel like and that it kind of works out somehow. The harvest gets taken in because everyone sort of spontaneously goes out to do it. When I said the power of love is what motivates everything, it's sort of that, but it's a kind of complicated love. It's like people love to work and they love society and so they feel motivated to work because they're doing something for what they love and they love nature so they want to be out in nature. People have sort of two lines of work, mostly. Mostly they do a job, like the boatman, and then they mostly, all in the, and in their leisure time, they do handicrafts like glass working or um, metal working to make beautiful objects, little objets d'art. And everything is free in this society. Uh, housing is free. There is no money. Everything, you go to a shop, you can just have things. They say, why don't you take some more? Just have more. Don't just have that one pipe, have another one. Have more tobacco, more. They still have people who have decided that what they're going to do is to have a shop. It's a job mainly given to small children. But there's no, you know, buying or anything. It's just because everyone is motivated by love, it all sort of works out. The blacksmithing and stuff does go on in factories. But it's more like, you know, workshare places, workshare factories. So you go to the factory and they've got a great forge and they've got all these fantastic smithing facilities and you can go in and try your hand and make yourself a nice brooch and there's people on hand to tell you all about it and that's kind of how the economy works yeah that's how it all works all you know glass blowing or whatever and then you you do some of that and then that goes out to the shops and equally the you know the there's someone at home looking after the house because they enjoy that being their job mostly Um, women (laughs) because they enjoy that sort of but the thing. women also do you know there are women blacksmiths and and stone masons workers and, and stonemasons yeah. i mean it doesn't explain who's in the mines um but they've got rid of almost all machinery except they've got like some sort of techno vitalist steam like boats and like all the factories run on magic power well they don't really have machinery in the factories they're just sort of places for coming together to have like an enormous kiln or something yeah but the kiln has no fire oh yeah what does that run on like vitalism oh something or other yeah so there's a few bits of kind of magic but he doesn't really want to get into it but like technology solved it there is a little bit of technology but it's the sort of technology which is basically wizardry and then the rest of technology has been safely got rid of um and it's kind of everything is like the middle ages it's all manor houses and the family has changed as well which is important it's free love because everyone's got everything they want there's no problem with property and people sort of change relationships and it's a sort of free love utopia and he just got goes goes around london and london is it's like a big giant park there are quite a few houses which are like solid cottages nestling amongst trees and bushes and then there are stunning sort of gothic cathedrals which are like the public buildings yeah and there are sort of manor houses and there are manor houses and then there are relics of old london like they've kept the british museum as a sort of warning yeah you can go in and look at it and then famously of course the uh palace of westminster the Houses of Parliament are used for the storage of various things, including manure. And for selling cabbages. There's a little uh, fruit and vegetable market at one end, but the grand markets are in more impressive buildings elsewhere. By the way, if you want to live somewhere, you just rock up and they've got to let you in. Um, but then they like it. But you wouldn't go to somewhere where you weren't wanted. So The, um, the landscape, to say that it's a park, it's uh, kind of at the wild end of a sort of English l- like landscape garden, yeah, a jardin anglais. It's kind of Eden. Universally picturesque, I think. It's like a golden age. The society anticipated is a golden age, like the Greek image. Everyone is beautiful, tanned, buff. Something in this society is that because they live such healthful lives in such wonderful circumstances, they age very slowly. So for early on, he's always running into all these women. He thinks, four 
she's very good looking and uh, she can't be more than 20 and she's actually she says, 47 I'm 35 <laughs> <laughs> but everyone is made beautiful by these conditions and everyone thinks that he must be about 80 years old and he's 57 so they go around london a bit and then they go on the voyage which is the second half which is the most sort of edwardian victorian thing imaginable which is they go on a boat trip the thames and that allows him to kind of describe how the suburbs have been sort of basically destroyed and the countryside is just full of beautiful villages and um, old manor houses have been returned into sort of collective housing. And they're going up to, as a group, to partake in haymaking, which is always sort of off in the distance and driving them on in this dream. At one point they stop and they come into a great hall of a guest house and they're sort of having discussions about various things. And on the walls are, he says, depictions of old stories that I thought people would have forgotten by now. And I was thinking, is this like religion? No, which which is, we haven't spoken about it probably enough, but religion has talked about it a lot in all of these utopias. What he's talking about are fairy tales. And at the more kind of Hans Christian Andersen end of things. And then there's a long discussion description of fairy tales and he's like oh but these are just childish things and the people are sort of shocked and horrified and like why should it be childish to believe in fairies and magic i found them i find these things inspiring and serious i think there's a really important relationship there which is that morris is clearly doing a fairy tale or something fairy tale like and he thinks that fairy tales are really important and serious and he thinks that like if everyone thought like that, it would be like that. And he says that the, the society is so beautiful that people are kind of like fairy tales. The women are all like beautiful fairy tale princesses. Golden haired. We went up a paved path between the roses and straight into a very pretty room, panelled and carved and as clean as a new pin, but the chief ornament of which was a young woman light-haired and grey-eyed, but with her face and hands and bare feet tanned quite brown with the sun, though she was very lightly clad. That was clearly from choice, not from poverty, though these were the first cottage dwellers I had come across, for her gown was of silk, and on her wrists were bracelets that seemed to me of great value. She was lying on a sheepskin near the window but jumped up as soon as we entered, and when she saw the guests behind the old man, she clapped her hands and cried out with pleasure, and when she got us into the middle of the room, fairly danced round us in delight of our company. So one of the ways in which the narrator is sort of touched is that he's constantly falling in love with all of these girls, like, or, or kind of getting, getting aroused, certainly. He's having these kind of little erotic sort of fantasy moments with with a whole series of women who you know will kiss him or give like hold his hand or whatever it's it's it's, it's, it's going to be a free love society the next place they go is that cottage which was described there which has two residents father and the daughter the daughter ellen is is like she's like the britannia for this society she's like instead of explaining in a political manifesto he just describes this really beautiful image of a woman and in a way, that is the manifesto of the society. It's going to be this erotic fairy tale dream of a society of bliss. It's a bliss which is a bliss of life, leisure, work, like creative fulfillment, physical bounty and beauty, sexual bliss, liberty to be whatever you want to be. And it's encapsulated in this woman. And there's also her father, who is a grumbler, ventriloquizes the opposition, saying, like, you need competition, like, all artworks are boring because everyone is just happy and everyone's being silly and flippant and these fairy tales are stupid. The way they take them, that on is they just say, yeah. <laughs> ha ha, pups. <laughs> what they do then is they go up the river. She, like, bumps into them again. She's, like, rode up because... She finds him, she couldn't bear the prospect of not seeing this, like, 57-year-old hideously haggard guy again. I think, he mu I think he must be attractively wrinkled. They carry on. They never quite get to haymaking. They go to a manor, and there's this weird transmogrification. So they go to this manor, and there's this brilliant feast laid out. But as he's there, things don't kind of start to go strange. And actually, this is one of the few bits of good writing, I thought. He's there... 
And suddenly he starts to become less and less real. People are looking at him or they're looking through him. And then he sort of waves and like people look and they can't. They can sort of semi-see him and they can't see him. He's And he's been having this fear building up. This premonition that he's got to go back to the world. And he's felt that. So, and it's sort of been building up and it comes and he's like overcome with this fear. And he staggers out. He sees a beggar on the road and he's like hideously haggard but not old and he's like he's thin our society is death and he's gone out of this kind of manner which is incidentally like the frontispiece of the book and it's morris's house and that you really get this feeling of morris like who's morris who was like a like multi multi millionaire in today's terms inherited tons of money you know built all these houses for himself and things and he's got this house in the country and he's trying to fulfil his sort of medieval fantasies, making all these beautiful things, setting up his enterprises, very seriously engaging with kind of like, you know, doing goodbyes workers and things. And then he leaves his house and sees the outside world kind of intruding on him. And there's this sort of shock. There's an obvious big problem with this book, isn't there? Which is that it's just this like rich guy wanting to have everything. You know, I said earlier about Bellamy that his book is this kind of universalization of the character of the well-off professional. And that's kind of what Utopia looks like, is everyone can be that. And in News From Nowhere, in but in Morris, the idea is, is that, or the vision is of an idea where everyone is like a rich bohemian, essentially. Well, not everyone is exactly William Morris, who is like a one-off. Everyone is this guy who is incredibly rich, and devotes himself to handicraft. Handicraft, free love, and beauty. You can see the type of joy that people take in doing the haymaking or whatever that is, I'm sure, the kind of thing which Morris himself loved to do. There's no, there are no, there are no sort of pressures. See, they can easily waste the whole day and it doesn't really matter. And all they really care about is hanging out with their friends and sort of talking about things. And it is that sort of be, that bohemian lifestyle. And the shop, I think, is really revealing, which is where you go into the shop and the shopkeeper is just wanting to give you more and more stuff. He's someone who could have as much stuff from whatever shop, whatever he wanted, whenever, all his life. This system is like, well, everyone can have that and no one will feel guilty. And the shopkeeper isn't conniving because they just want to give everything away. And it's just like this weird like guilt. that He's clearly having an enormous amount of fun by leading the reader around this vision of london transformed and so there are an awful lot of jokes about well we're in this place now but it's so completely different you know and it's quite nice if you live in london because he'll talk about where you live yeah he goes through all of them and they've all been they've all been transformed in some suitably like ironic and amusing way one thing about it that's really attractive to people is a lot of socialist writing is kind of very concerned in nitty-gritty it's concerned in work the relationships of power within work and it can be described as being pleasureless. And this world is entirely a world of pleasure. It's this golden age of bounteous harvests, bodily joys. The whole world is that. There is a bit of like how the society works, which is basically that before like factories just made ugly things and everything that's made by the industrial system just falls apart so as soon as you get get away from that everything will last forever and everything will be perfect but really i think it's this message of like we want a utopia of joy there is a really irritating side of it as well so i think that perhaps what it, what i feel a little bit aggrieved at is the respective reputations of this book and bellamy's book because i, I don't think that bellamy's book is worse than this one i think this is a better read Mm, I'm not sure it is. I found it pretty annoying, actually. Of the books we read, Bellamy was the one that I had the most trouble with reading because it's so much explaining communism and not wanting to call it communism. Like, that's like... Most of the book is that. But this one is so much like... It's all kind of didactic. Like, all the didacticism which is in Dr. Leet's monologues here is sort of acted out by these like picturesque yokels and it's totally stupid and it's like rich man's fantasy like the problem in uh looking backwards is like the capitalist system is destructive the problem in this world is that people just don't see things morris's way and he's childlike like and stupid but has its charms, I thought. I, I didn't have a problem. May, I think I also have a bias in favour of uh, the sort of seriousness of 
utopias which really try to think through the difficult matter of organization yeah. that i don't think utopia is ever going to be procured by like spontaneously i think it's going to be it's going to involve a bit of infrastructural thinking and a certain amount of organization at some level but i just wanted to talk briefly about one final uh, response to bellamy and this one is from 20 years after Morris's, so 1911, by uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who is an interesting figure. I mean, had been involved in sort of, you know, setting up these kind of utopian communities and things. I mean, in a sense, she was sort of a Bellamyite and a woman. Woman, terrifying prospect. We don't, we don't have very many of them on the podcast. No, not nearly enough, I'm afraid, in the history of architecture. But um, so the book we're talking about is Moving the Mountain, which is by no means her best known book, but it's the one which is very consciously like a, a kind of updating of Bellamy to the point of explicitly mentioning him on about page 20. So it, that's very, very clear. Uh, her, her better known book, well, there's the story The Yellow Wallpaper, which is like very well read, and also Her Land, which is another utopia, but much more kind of fantastical, uh, which is about a society where women kind of reproduce spontaneously. And I don't there are think no it's men. any more fantastical than News from Nowhere. Yeah, it involves a different sort of dimension of fantasy, I guess. Yeah. Even in this one, it's Moving the Mountain. Moving the Mountain, it's called, yeah. And it, the sort of lost figure who's unexpectedly ushered into Utopia is this chap who, and in some kind of mysterious circumstances, and then is recovered. But even in this book, the first person he meets is a very beautiful woman who happens to be his sister. But he thinks how miraculously well-preserved she is for her age. And uh, I mean, the book does various things. One of the things that it plays around with, which he's obviously interested in, is the social construction of gender rather than the sort of situation of the emancipation of women within these legal problems. And so one of the first things that the narrator does is he sort of reads some contemporary press and uh, some magazines, and there's a funny bit where he says, one of the articles was an extension of municipal service and involved so much comment on preceding steps that I found it most enlightening. The other was a recent suggestion in educational psychology, and this too carried a retrospect of recent progress which gave me much food for thought. The story was a clever one. I found I found it really amusing, and only on a second reading did I find what it was that gave the queer flavour to it. It was a story about women, two women who were in a business partnership with their adventures singly and together. I looked through it carefully. They were not even girls. They were not handsome. They were not in process of being married. In fact, it was not once mentioned whether they were married or not, ever had been or ever wanted to be. Yet, I had found it most amusing. So it's Bellamy in the sense that it's completely classless. Um, and so one of the people he meets on the steamship is um, a chap who's working as the ship's engineer, but he discovers that he's a Harvard man. So he's had like a very kind of prestigious education, but he's working on this boat in this capacity because he very much enjoys the work and that's the kind of thing which he's into. And it's also one in which actually like the professional status of women as equal participants in every kind of dimension of society has been worked out the organization of the economy is basically that that which existed in bellamy that's not one of the things that she particularly is interested in updating i would say that there are two big areas where she tries to one obviously is gender and the other is ecology the big difference i think is that it's much more of a kind of garden city society but one of the things which is notable is that i think that she was really really interested in agriculture a kind of how the resources of the fertility of the soil and the earth were going to be husbanded and needed to be needed to be kind of conserved so the passages which were all about like retaining soil fertility and stopping soil erosion and these sorts of things. It was already a problem in America, but it was going to become a major big deal in the, like, not long after then. And I guess it was probably already... And it's worth saying that in each country as they developed, and um, this has happened successively in Britain and Germany and America and Japan and China now and India, you have a period when, like, economic growth dominates, and that absolutely trashes the environment. The rivers get caught on fire with all the chemicals being dumped in them and everyone is eating poison and the air is so poor that people die by the tens of thousands in smogs. And that certainly happened in 
Britain and it certainly happened in Germany and it certainly happened in Japan. There's a reason that mercury poisoning is called itai itai disease. There would be a real vital urge. You see, in our earlier kind of agriculture, the first thing we did was to cut down the forest, dig up and burn over, plough, harrow and brush fine, to plant our little grasses. All that dry, soft, naked soil was helplessly exposed to the rain, and the rain washed it steadily away. In one heavy storm, soil that had taken centuries of forest growth to make would be carried off to clog the rivers and harbours. This struck us all at once as wasteful. We began to realise that food could grow on trees as well as grasses, that the cubic space occupied by a chestnut tree produced bushels of nutrient, m- more bushels of nutriment than the linear space below it. Of course, we have our wheat fields yet but around every exposed flat acreage is a broad belt of turf and trees. Every river and brook is broadly bordered with turf and trees or shrubs. We have stopped soil waste to a very great extent. Also, we make soil, but that is a different matter. So, I mean, it's almost this kind of permaculture. They spend a long time on the on the roads of the society, which are, and they're all lined with sort of fruit trees. They're, they're like these continuous ribbons of fruit and nut and other cultivation which sort of run through all of the different places and which are a kind of continuous but productive garden what's the inhabitation in that environment i mean there are cities but they're they're kind of garden cities and it's a slight greening of bellamy's ideas he, he's kind of looking at this city and the, the it's, it's explained that essentially all of their electricity is produced what we would now call like um, renewably. So they have windmills, water mills, tide mills, solar engines. They even have hand power. So he says um, there are all kinds of storage batteries now, uh, little ones for houses. There are ever so many people whose work does not give them bodily exercise and who do not care much for games. They can use these sort of hand and foot pumps and like pump up the power grid in their in their downtime and it all goes to nourish the uh, and kind of power the totality yeah i mean within that people are living in cities and they're living in in the country but it's very much the focus has turned away i think from the maintenance of the industrial complex towards like that's become kind of recited within a, a broader like ecology so agriculture is really not mentioned very much in looking backwards at all it's sort of treated as a settled problem but here it's an enormous focus in vril farming is just a big open-air factory and it's like robots and scientific breeding and like huge mechanization which is kind of true of um what is to be done as well like Everything becomes the factory. Yeah, and the farm becomes a factory as well. You know, these fantastic Ford-ist factories where everything is moving around in this poetry of motion is extended across the whole of society. And this is different, but what is the land like? It's like a mega permaculture. It's like a mega permaculture, exactly. They're these kind of, they're farms, they're forests, they're kind of in balance, they reinforce one another. And... Yeah, unlike in industry where, like, mechanization is able to, like, ever-increasing mechanization and kind of innovation is able to solve the problems, here it's the sort of necessary deployment of nature's own yeah. remedies. I mean, I think that reading this book, it's interesting how the sort of principles which it defines, I think, are not all that much changed 100 years later. You know, it's sort of difficult to think of a way in which it's significantly off the way it conceives the sort of relationship between production and you know ecology wilderness and the landscape except we haven't done that at all yeah we haven't done it but we've kind of managed to successfully industrially ramp up production enormously i mean it does seem to be killing all the insects well i think we should try and wrap up a bit i think that the yeah what do you think happens to this idea i mean maybe the first world war I don't think you can do this after Auschwitz. And then there's also the Soviet Union and the general revolutions, which is a society, albeit a slightly different society, trying to put, and very seriously, they definitely were communists. I think all the readings of what happened in the Soviet Union as 
being a result of like sinister cynicism or corruption of the message aren't true the people who were engaging in it were communists and they were seriously trying to bring about communism and that's a kind of live experiment which is very much concrete another thing that happens is that a lot of this stuff is put into practice in the west 10 percent of it or like 20 percent of it you have the new deal in america which has social aspects like a certain amount of nationalization of industry goes on across the west uh, projects to do with ecology a better provision of universal education a better provision of so like a little bit of social democracy kind of creeps in in the west so some stuff is done but also you have this countervailing force rather like i think the french revolution set back the kind of radical side of english politics for a very long time because you had a near neighbor reign of terror and they were an enemy and in the west the soviet union was an enemy it was putting this stuff into practice and they were a bugbear and it just there isn't the room i think that bellamy is creeping in bellamy is going you don't need to be radical this isn't going to be a wild departure things are going to be the same except it's going to be better all the problems are going to go the gap that he is trying to you know put his wedge in gone i don't have any evidence for any of this and like folk etymological history is very dodgy if someone has done work on this i would be interested to hear please tell me about it yeah i think well after you have the revolution in russia and you have actually existing kind of industrial communism well it puts a whole different complexion on this particular thought experiment because it becomes something quite different and then after the second world war you quite quickly start to enter the era of apparent plenty where you have quite fast economic growth and you have uh, the figure of the consumer and so you have quite a different relationship because we seem to be in a society in which which is kind of delivering material goods and which somehow is kind of alienating people by other and more insidious means. So no longer by the kind of whip of hunger. For the most, for the most part, it's important to say. So, I mean, so that the sorts of uh, utopias and dystopias you start to see are mapping, you know, other sorts of changes, other sorts of kind of transpositions. But I think it also it's time, it's time has kind of come back around again, Moving hasn't the it? mountain th- is interesting because it comes out in the age of dystopia the beginning of the age of dystopias really which is the which is i guess the period just before the first world war to and they kind of carry on right i mean they carry on certainly into the 50s probably and then after then you've got sort of science fiction i mean wells is definitely writing science fiction in terms of where utopian fiction has gone or dystopian speculative fiction goes into science fiction i would say in the 50s and 60s yeah definitely you know, Philip K. Dick isn't exactly utopian or dystopian. You know, he is satirising and speculating about the sort of American industrial economy, political... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that kind of that kind of futurity, like, expands into a whole enormous genre. The thing I wanted to say is that it's time, sort of, the kind of machine utopia's time has kind of come back around again in the sense that people are, like, uh, fully automated luxury communism is a, is a meme at the moment for a reason isn't it it's a it's a thing which is being talked about amazon seems to have created its own kind of like dark inversion of bellamy's big pneumatic warehouse hasn't it and also um ai is kind of replacing like vitalism as like this sort of solution as this problem and solution you know so i think that it is good it's good to be talking about these things because i think that they do have are very kind of resonant with the future which people are trying to imagine at the moment. There's another difficult point for me, which is aesthetics, right? Aesthetics have an attachment to a politics because of association, not for any particular reason. Morris' socialist utopia is medieval, essentially, because that's what he's into. Bellamy's is slightly steampunk Victorian because he believes things should be the same. Everyone is like Tuscany, Vril is like it's really strange aesthetically. It's like it's like somewhere between heaven and hell. Everyone, all these like it's kind of quite like William Blake doing sci-fi, maybe like no. I think Vril robots. is the it's the Tuscany of the 
background of like 15th century paintings. It's all lit by silver weird light surrounded by gloom with these tall grey haughty figures with wrapped in like velvety wings. It does have a bit of like weird William Blake and there are all of these like silent protector automatons. But they're str- I think that the landscape is a sort of strangely uh, kind of condensed and intensified. It's the strangest place. Yeah, and then Gilman's, I think, is very, like, for me, looks like a garden city. I think that's what... It... But, I mean, Ebenezer Howard had happened. Yeah, that's well, no, the that's 18, why, yeah. Like, late 1880s, and it's like, it's a bit, it's only a bit after looking backwards. And and it becomes very popular at the end of the 19th century. Into that. So they're, they're sort of our models. They're very inventive, some of these, aren't they? I'm, I'm more interested in the, like, invention of, like, material conditions. Absolutely. I think that, for certainly for me, the pleasure is all in the imagination of the everyday the quotidian in utopia yeah. the way people go to the shops the way people cook the oh, like of the when we did our dystopias episode the, the bits that really stuck with me are the city in we which i think in terms of its writing was probably the weakest of the three but had this amazing place yeah. and what these like parallelepiped glass rooms and like all the curtains coming down at sex hour, and like and like, what's life like when all your furniture is glass? And you know the machinery and things of Brave New World as well. You know the hatchery. What does it mean? And like the baby training facilities and things. What does it? What does it mean? What? How do you do this? And like all the the suburban lifestyle of, you know, zero gravity tennis or whatever. How do you inhabit, like, you create utopia and then how do you inhabit it? Because in a way, it's a test, isn't it? It's a test of the system. Because Bellamy knew that. Bellamy knew it was a test of the system. And he said, you can have exactly what you've got now. Nothing has to change. It's going to be fine. There's nothing to worry about. You're not going to have to have weird foreign food or anything. (laughs) Utopian fiction tends to believe that the natural condition is utopia. Or that utopia is a sort of, is a kind of stable state which just, you just have to make a shift in the balance and you'll be on the utopian track. And naturally that means that you shift, you pull a few levers in society and you see what the sort of effect is. Now, I don't believe that thesis, but it's a good mirror. We are fast closing on the year 3000 at this rate. Cool, okay. So, I, I mean, I think we're going to have to bid farewell from, um, from the, uh, see you the, in kind of, the kind of sunlit, tree-lined burbling fountained streets of utopia but thanks a lot for joining us on this little excursion and uh, i think we'll be back to architecture yeah back to normal there's a bit of been a bit of a di- diversion so thanks a lot for joining us uh we will be producing some kind of bonus content for this episode it's the mystery box question mark on all sides i'm not sure what we're going to do but it's going to be interesting you can have that if you subscribe to our patreon or at patreon.com slash about underscore buildings and we'll be putting some suitably resonant imagery on social media at about underscore buildings on all of the main ones um and yeah well thank you very much for listening if you have a moment we would love you to rate and review the show on itunes because it's very helpful for us and makes it easier for other people to discover the show please do please do so good night good night